business owners likely will have only one shot to sell a business. Most don't understand what drives value and how buyers look at a business. Until now. Welcome to the How to Sell a Business podcast, where every week we talk to the subject matter experts, advisors, and those around the deal table about how to sell at maximum value. Every business will go to sell one day. It's only a matter of when. We're glad you're here. The podcast starts now. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. So welcome to another episode of How to Sell a Business Podcast. This is a show where I interview buyers, sellers, and other professional advisors on what makes a business saleable and at maximum value. So I'm your host. My name is Ed Meisigland, and I have over 30 years of experience in business sales, business valuation, and exit planning. So on today's show, um, we're going to do frequently asked questions. I get, the, I, I compile, I compile a list. And once we get to critical mass, um, I start looking at, you know, are there some cons- consistent themes? And then I compile them and we, we make an episode. So, so today, like I said, is going to be about frequently asked questions and we'll get started here in a second. But if you want more tips about how to maximize the value of your business, you can follow me at Twitter for the podcast, uh, handle at sell a business pod, S E L L A B I Z P O D, or you can follow my personal Twitter account, which is at Ed Myso, M Y S O. And as always, you can, you can certainly sign up for the newsletter and that's at how to sell a business podcast.com. And we'll have a link in the show notes. So, okay, we'll get started with our first question. So this first question is. It's kind of, I don't want to say a horror story, but it's a, it, it's a challenge for a buyer that uh, was working with the seller and, and at the 11th hour, they're retrading as a result of pulling, um, pulling assets out of what is being sold. So, so the question is more so to the sellers of being clear on what you're selling. And most of the time, we need to establish what types of assets are going to be sold with the business. And so there's two types of sales. There's a stock sale and there's an asset sale. When you have a stock sale, everything everything on the balance sheet goes, all right? 100%, all the cash, everything, everything goes. And there's not a whole lot of discussion other than the integrity of the, you know, of, of what is being transferred from buyer to seller. Um, and then you have an asset sale. So in an asset sale, you'll remember that, uh, and I've talked about it before that the buyer has to sign or pay two checks. All right. Have, two checks that are written. The first one is to buy the business. And what does that mean? That means under an asset sale, it's buying the tangible and intangible assets. So the tangible assets are, you know, the, the equipment, machinery, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, inventory, what creates, you know, all the tangible stuff. The intangibles are just the, the things like the goodwill, the customer list, the reputation, the phone number, the domains, um, you know, the, the internet presence, the social media handles, those are all intangible assets that go with, you know, the tangible and intangible assets under an asset sale. And the second check that the buyer writes is for working capital. So that those are the two types of transactions, how they work. But now let's let's look at it from the standpoint of an asset sale and you start pulling out assets that are material to operating the business. Recently, we had a similar situation where the guy's like, you know, I'm, I'm taking my pickup truck with me. Well, the pickup truck is the one that does the estimating, you know, so that he drives around, does the estimating for, for the business. And at the end of the day, the, 
whoever comes in is going to need some sort of transportation in order to fulfill that person's role or the owner's role in this case. And so if you're going to take that asset off of the balance sheet, then you're going to have to have the the seller is going to have to concede on value because the buyer is going to have to pay in order to um in order to have in this case another vehicle for that person or himself to estimate those jobs same thing we see this a lot in manufacturing where there's a either there's a die or there's some sort of some sort of um uh piece of equipment that is jet that has been developed and they want to take it with them but you know they they say well look i'm not going to be i'm not going to I'm going to I'm not competing with going to compete with you. Well, you know, if I'm the buyer, the buyer's sitting there saying, "Yeah, I'm not really certain I buy <laughs> I buy that." But but for for the sake of this conversation, you know, that particular asset is what generated the revenue which subsequently generated the profit, which subsequently generated the value. And when you put all of that together and you start removing those things, there's a value penalty. And so, so as I'm talking to specifically sellers here, you can't just pick and choose assets that come off of the, uh, off of the balance sheet without adjusting value. And, and in this case, I would first adjust the income. Like if you're going to take, <laughs> if you're going to take a, piece of equipment off of the balance sheet, you need to take off the revenue and the related expense from the income statement. So you're comparing apples and apples. Anything can be done. The The issue that is always the problem is transparency. You can't wait till the 11th hour to say, look, I'm going to you know, take X, Y, and Z with me. And then the buyer all of a sudden is like, well, what else is this guy taking with him and how is that going to affect the business and just so you're aware the buyer a confused buyer is not going to buy if you start if you at the 11th hour you start pulling things off of the asset list that's being acquired you chances are you are going to get uh in a situation where the the buyer is going to retrade and rightfully so they the waiting Till the end to to come up with the conclusion of this is not going with the business is is in is poor form. So if you are going to start taking things off of the balance sheet or they're not going to be included in the sale beyond you know your personal assets, of course those go. You need to disclose that up front, and in in doing so, you'll be miles ahead. All right, the second or yeah, the second question that that was asked had to do with non-competes and whether or not this person had had heard that non there's going to be no more non-competes and so that is that's a considerable issue um when selling a business so at any rate i i dug a little bit and let me share what i found and i'm i'm not an attorney i'm only playing one here on the internet Please seek your own advice as it relates to this kind of thing. So from the March 2023 general or today's general counsel article about the FTC banning um, uh, non-compete agreements. So the FTC defines a non-compete agreement as a contractual term between an employer and and a worker that prevents the worker from seeking or accepting employment with a person or operating a business after the conclusion of the worker's employment with the employer. The proposed rule exempts any non-compete agreements that are entered into a person who is selling the business or ownership interest in a business when the person uh, restricted is substan- is a substantial owner or member of the business sold. And so that pretty much rules out just about every type of small business um, being excluded from the provisions of non-competes. So let's talk a little bit about the non-competes. What, what, what do you, what should you anticipate? Well, the first thing is you got to define what the non-compete is about. All right. So you need to know what 
what are you pre being prevented from doing? Is it soliciting customers? Is it a geographic area? Is it, you know, you can't talk to anybody in the industry that might want to utilize a, <clears throat> um, you know, a service or product that, that, uh, that the business that you're selling, um, has or does. Um, the next thing is, you know, you, you do want to be in a position that, you know, if you're not ready to retire, perhaps, you know, we, we see a lot of business owners that go into consulting. Um, again, it's back to transparency. You know, what is it that you're going to do? You know, if you're going to, <clears throat> you know, serve, serve on the board of another company that's competing with the company you're selling, <laughs> naturally it's going to create some heartburn you know from the buyers that, that 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 does not if you're going to lend your your history and your experience to somebody that can adversely affect the company you're selling it's probably not going to go very well um the number of years it tends to be um it tends to be a um two to three years. I mean, we've seen some five years, but the majority of the time, most people are pushing back and you'll see the uh, uh, non-compete for, like I said, two two to three years within a particular um, time frame or uh, be between a, you know, a geographic area. Um, but we're not seeing much, much greater than that. And then... You know, the last thing I think is defining who, who are we competing, who, who are we preventing you from competing with? And when I say that, you have a customer list, you have a supplier list, you have, you know, people that you've done service for. Are you carving out those particular people or are you, or again, back to, are you carving out an entire industry or the entire you know what are what are you what are you doing most of the time we're seeing that the buyer the buyer that's pushing back is saying look i'm not i'm not willing to let the seller compete against me on any in any way shape or form most of the time we see sellers they're running from their business they are they are done and they want to retire and they want to move on but in the, in the case where we have buyers that or i'm sorry sellers that that perhaps aren't totally done. It's like I said, it's a matter of transparency on what you plan to do next. And if you'll remember when we talk about transitions, I mean, it, it, depending on the business, you should anticipate, you know, following the sale, you're going to be with that business from three months to, you know, perhaps a year, perhaps a year in helping that business transition from point A to point B. During that time, you can you can you know you'll have a non compete in place certainly, um, and if that the provisions of that non compete need to be changed, you know once you collectively you and the buyer collectively know what your next steps are, um, you know you might be surprised at, at what somebody's willing to do once they understand that you know you're not interested in in building you know, going out and building a, a separate business to compete against them. It's interesting. I won't, I won't say that we, we haven't seen that in the past. We have, um, you know, unfortunately if, if, um, you know, there's some bad, bad actors out there, chances are we'll end up getting dragged in or at least our, our information that we, that we use to sell the business, um, will get subpoenaed and, you know, there are bad actors and and it behooves you to have an attorney that puts together uh if i'm a buyer it behooves them to put together a a a um you know a um non compete that's tight and that you that that you as the seller aren't going to compete against them and if you do and if that buyer does or the seller the outgoing seller does indeed compete. They should expect to be sued. Now I can tell you it does it doesn't happen very often. Most of the time, if if the buyer smells that the 
seller is going to perhaps not subscribe to the integrity that uh, is expected, that buyer is not going to buy. And the seller just needs to understand that that it, if that's the game you're playing, chances are someone's going to structure a deal that either is going to prevent you from doing so, or they're, they're going to be in a position following the sale to sue the pants off of you. All right, that's question number two. So I often get asked different books or podcasts or different things that uh, a seller or a buyer can use um, in their acquisition search or preparing their business for sale. All right, so here are my three um my three books, I'm going to do books this time. The first one is Built to Sell. This is a, this is a great book from John Warillo um, about how to build a saleable company. And you would think that, you know, I, I, let me back up. I, I, I think John Warillo has done more for the value community than any business appraiser. I mean, I, I stack him up in the category with Shannon Pratt, who is the godfather of business valuation. And I'm telling you, um, the work that John does with the value builder system and it, it helps business owners understand what they have and what a buyer is going, is looking at and how these different, you know, eight drivers of value can affect business value. And it, the funny thing is, um, it's, I don't want to say it's not hard. Everything's hard as it relates to working on your business. But what, but what is really telling is that you can understand what creates value in your business and then choose to work on different drivers that can influence the value. And I can, I'll give you, you know, the short, the short version and everybody, every seller has probably heard this a hundred times is that if you are the business, you know, there's a, there's somewhat of a value penalty. You know, if, if there's not, and there's nothing wrong with it, by the way, that there is absolutely nothing wrong with you being, you being the owner operator of your business, it's creating a great lifestyle for you. And that is not a problem. If you want to increase the value far beyond what, where you're at, you make it into a, a business that can operate without you. Simple as that. And then there's, like I said, there's seven other drivers that, that you can turn those levers and increase the, the value. And what I, what it distills down to is predictability. A business that is predictable will be worth more because the risk is less. And when risk is less, value is more. So yeah, John Warillo, um, yeah, built to sell. Uh, Gino Wickman, Traction. Traction is another great book. Um, you know, the EOS system and systems like that, anytime you're, 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 you're creating an environment where um, there's accountability and processes and um, and various different means for an outsider to come in and understand the business. That here are goals. Here are things that we're going to achieve, and we're taking step by step by step on how to achieve them. And then there's accountability markers. In order to achieve them, and 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 Gino Wickman with Traction has done a, a a great job in introducing that to that to the to the masses. And I think I think when you, I, to my knowledge, there's not any empirical evidence on this, but boy, I would sure love to know the um, how much more valuable. An EOS driven business is than one without. And so, anyway, if you know anybody that uh, has done any of those kinds of studies, you know, let me know. I would love to include that in, in a future episode. The last thing is more buyer specific, but, you know, good, uh, good defense is 
you know, what is it? A, a good offense is a uh, is a or a good defense. Uh, hey, do me a favor, strike that. So the next business, sorry, strike that again. The next book is predominantly about buyers, and that's the Harvard Business Review Guide to Buying a Small Business. And I share that. I know this is how to sell a business, but part of what I wanted to share is that this is you see this this is on colleges this is in you know in all of the entrepreneurship through acquisition meetups and 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 books that are being purchased on Amazon if you look at how many of these books have been purchased i mean it's crazy just to to see you know how many people are using this as their guide to you know to um to buy a business and so it is if i'm a seller this is a great book to to know what the buyer is looking for and what is expected from me as the seller for to give to that buyer or to sh you know share with the buyer and so i i i refer to this book a lot to a number of different people I, I guess lecture at one of the local universities and this is one of their required readings and it's it is a, it is a great book and so if you're buying a business that is that is it i will have links to those three books um in the show notes and we'll move on to our next question so the next question is about um some legal issues and and like i told you i'm i'm not an attorney um, and I would always tell you, confer with an attorney, um, you know, about some of the finer points of, of, you know, of, of anything legal, whether you're on the buy side or the sell side, everyone needs representation always, always, always. So, but I did make kind of a, a checklist of things that you need to, as a seller, the things you need to keep in mind. So the first thing is you got to leave. And the, again, these are about legal matters. How are you going to, to control your confidential information? All right. Whether that's, you know, if you're using a, a, a full service brokerage like ours, or you're doing it yourself, how are you going to control or how is that person going to control the, the, the release of the information? You know, are they going to have a, you know, certainly they're going to have a confidentiality agreement. What kind of qualifications are being done, um, you know, before the release of that information? If it's a competitor, you are you reviewing um, who that competitor is and what potential damage that can be can be done? From our standpoint, you know, we spend a, a just a ton of time educating buyers on the damage that can be done if they're idiots. And I and I when I say idiots, it. it that they choose to be, um, they choose to breach confidentiality. They don't, the, you know, they're the only, especially first time buyers. We talk a lot of first time buyers out of business just simply because they don't understand what they don't understand. Being head, head, you know, being CEO and head janitor at the same time, you know, that, that they just think, you know, it magic things magically happen and it's just not the case. And so, like I said, we talk a lot of people out of it. So you, you want to control that information. Second, you need to understand the type of sale that is, you know, that you're going to have. Your accountant will tell you you want a stock sale. All right. The buyer's side is going to say you need an asset sale. And you know what is right it just kind of depends on the business but you need to keep in mind that there there are you know different types of sales and one may be advantageous to you than more advantageous to you than the other and so you just need to get your arms around you know what what is best for you and what's what is likely that the buyer is going to agree to uh, the next thing, and I touched on this earlier, is you know what are what are you selling? You know these are the tangible and intangible assets that are going to be sold in my business, 
and you just need to to uh, a detailed list to, to to share with the buyer. But you have to have some sort of clear understanding of of what you're what you're selling, and certainly don't wait till the last minute in order to do so. Um, if you have any kind of intellectual property, you probably need to. Um, I don't want to say get a separate appraisal, but you know, there's people that do IP work. Um, it's it's certainly expensive. If you need a referral, I'm, I'm happy to do so. But if you do have some, some bigger, if your business is, 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 you know, comprised of all intellectual property or patents and different uses like that, we need to probably get our arms around what you have and, and probably engage a, a an additional party to make sure that we're we all understand um, value and and you know next steps on how we're going to 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 sell it. Um, next, we when you do sell a business, and we'll we'll talk about like installment sales and and earnouts and different techniques that that buyers use in order to sell the business, but you have to be in a position to, um, you know, I always say, if you're going to be the bank, you, you, you deserve all the rights and privileges of a bank. Now, if there's the SBA or other, other entities, other banks, you know, they're going to take a, a senior position to yours, but nevertheless, you need to be in a position to, to size up how, if you are going to be carrying any kind of seller financing in any form, what's the likelihood you're going to be able to collect that? The next thing is, and we talked about this too, is the non-competes. All right. So, you know, what is it you want to do? I mean, if you're really going to retire, it shouldn't be an issue. If you're not quite ready to retire, you know, you have a, especially if you have like, like me, I've got 30 years in, in the business brokerage. What if I left, you know, this is all I really have done. So I know a lot of, a lot of things about this industry that probably are pretty valuable to somebody else. You know, so what's the likelihood you, you could stop me from doing so. Um, But my point is, that's the, but I'm not ready to retire by any means. Um, but my point is that y- you just need to be clear on, you know, some idea of, of what you're going to be doing and certainly understand that plans change and transparency always wins. And the all parties certainly understand that. Um, the next thing is, you know, uh, we will have an attorney on talking about representations and warranties. Um, you know, for for the short version, you know, representations and warranties are basically what you are saying the business has done, right? So books and records, taxes have been paid. All these different things have been done. Um, you know, I've only listed a couple of them, but but nevertheless, you're representing a warranty that, you know, essentially all the things that have been shared are true and accurate. All right. And in the event that that it's not, you know, there's recourse. And I can tell you from a small as a small business person, you know, you know, you're when I say small, you know, sub 10 million purchase price, you know, you're talking about a buyer who is going to to use even if they have all the money in the world they're still going to put some level of seller financing out there if for no other reason that they have your attention if something in your reps and warranties do, does not check out post sale so so my point is when you're going through you know from a legal standpoint um you need to be sensitive to what you know what those reps and warranties are, are saying and you know are you are you are you in compliance with them so pay attention to reps and warranties and then lastly you know um you know we see you know especially you know business you know owners that have been um been in the business for a long time 
you know, they, this is how we've done it. And the funny thing is that sometimes, you know, there's some, some laws and some ordinances that have changed over the years that they don't know about. And it only, and it only comes to light when we start doing due diligence that, oh, you know, I didn't know. So it would behoove you to be in a position to understand, you know, some of the, uh, you know, are you in compliance with OSHA? Are you in compliance with, you know, the, the, the local and state, state, uh, compliance laws? Those are, that would, those would be real helpful to know before you get into due diligence. So that's kind of my short list of, of legal items that, uh, you should kind of get your arms around. I hope, uh, that one helped. All right. Next question. Okay, this last question for today is about who who are the buyers for my business, and you know they kind of gave um, a specific. You know, this is the type of, of company I am. This is my size, and I thought it would be more helpful if I kind of tailor this to to uh, the broader audience. So, what types of buyers? Um, Let's start with the first kind, you know, under a half million dollars. And this, by the way, this is, this is uh, from the M&A source. Um, and I can tell from, I can tell you from our practice, we got 2,200 deals under our belt and it, it, this holds true, but they've done a study from across the country. So let me just share with you a little bit about, you know, who's buying. So under a half a million dollars, it's first time buyers. 50% first time buyers, uh, 28% are serial entrepreneurs. And then the balance are, are existing companies. Most of them are looking to buy themselves a job. And they believe this is something that's really telling is that 61% of those people are within 20 miles of the business that they bought. So between a half million and a million in purchase price, 39% were were first time buyers, 33% were existing companies, and then the balance were in serial entrepreneurs. 35% were motivated to buy a job, and then the balance were looking to grow through acquisition. Once again, you know, it's just about the same as far as where they come from is within 20 miles, you know, 56% of the buyers came within 20 miles of the existing location and 25% 50 miles and over. And then the balance over that. Um, and I should, I should make, you know, a point that the larger the business, um, the, the more likely someone is willing to move to buy it. So, Back to to our our analysis. So now we, between one and two million, all right, the buyers it, it decreases again. So first time buyers are now only thirty four percent. Existing companies that are buying, so they're growing through market share is thirty one percent, and then the balance is serial entrepreneurs. Um, they're motivated by buying. Thirty seven percent are motivated to buy a job. And 23% are looking at growing through, you know, as a horizontal add-on. Once again, we drop, we drop again by, um, you know, roughly 25, 30% where the buyer is coming 20 miles, you know, within 20 miles. So 40% of the buyers are coming from within 20 miles. And then the balance is coming over a hundred miles. In the two to five million range in purchase price, we the first time buyers just fall off. So it's existing companies buying, um, you know, uh, private offices, serial entrepreneurs is twenty four percent, and then private equity now enters the picture at the at twenty percent also. So they're looking. The reason that people are buying at this level is for a horizontal add-on at 44% and a vertical add-on at 20%. They're generally located more than 100 miles away. Um, that's, you know, 53%. And then the the balance, believe it or not, is 
is less than 20 miles away. And then from your five to $50 million range, you have existing companies um, are at 40% and private equity is at 60%. Um, certainly they're all motivated to uh, acquire um, through uh, horizontal add-ons and they're all, well, the majority, I should say, 80% are located further than than uh, 100 miles away. So so to answer your question as far as the type of buyer, it, it really depends on the size. I wouldn't discount anybody, um, you know, who might be your buyer. It might be your customers. You know, it might be your employees. It might be friends and family. It, there's a a uh, podcast or two back that that I did where um where we were talking about where to find buyers for for a health club and one of the one of the tricks of the trade was you know you put out a, a notice to your you know to your 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 most active members that you're looking at growing through acquisition, you know, you're looking at growth and you're looking for investors. And though that shook the bushes and then they found the buyer. And then you you, you slowly determine whether or not they are your candidate to to succeed you in ownership. And so there's different ways of, of doing it. Um, you know, certainly I'm happy to share with you what 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 we we what we have found effective. So that concludes um, question number five. So that's our frequently asked questions today. So I, I do want to thank you for listening to the podcast. Um, you know, we, I certainly hope that you found the information helpful in your journey to sell your business or gain a better understanding of the process of selling your business. You know, I always encourage you to seek out people that can help you. So as a call to action, you know, I encourage you to seek out whether it be investment bankers, business brokers, accountants, attorney, people, anybody in that deal space, um, have a conversation, have an exploratory conversation of what you're getting into because, you know, they provide valuable guidance, you know, because they, they've done it before. They, we, we have seen, deal after deal. So we're going where you want to go. And so we know the landmines. And so I, I hope you would, you'll take me up on either if you want, you know, it's certainly no obligation to, to talk to us. We're happy to, to visit. Um, but what we found is an educated seller is the best seller, not because you are a, <clears throat> an easier client. That's, that's a sidebar. But when you understand the process and you understand what the buyer is preparing to go through in buying your business, you're pretty close to it. So when you, when you do understand and you talk to your, the advisors that you have about the business and about what, what the buyer is looking for in your business, it will make your life so much easier. You will sell your business and you will sell it for maximum value. So. Again, thank you so much for tuning in, and we look forward to visiting with you again next week um, on the How to Sell a Business podcast. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us today on the How to Sell Your Business podcast. If you want more episodes packed with strategies to help sell your business for the maximum value, visit howtosellabusinesspodcast.com for tips and best practices to make your exit life-changing. Better yet, subscribe now so you never miss future episodes. This program is copyrighted by MISO Inc. All rights reserved.